Hello and welcome to Discovery, conversations about the power of the arts to connect us to each other and to place. I'm Victoria Rogers, Vice President of Arts at the Knight Foundation. Joining me today is Henry Timms, author, public speaker, creator of Giving Tuesday and president and CEO of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, preeminent performing arts complex here in the US and home to 12 performing arts companies and educational institutions dedicated to music, dance and drama. Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the Met, the New York Field, Juilliard, New York City Ballet, the Film Society of Lincoln Center, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, Jazz at Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center Theater at the Vivian Beaumont Theater and the School of American Ballet. If you have questions and we hope that you do today, please submit them through the show. If you're using Zoom, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Through Twitter, use the hashtag Night Live and in the comments section of Facebook live stream. We'll get to as many of them as we can throughout the conversation. Now, Henry, welcome to Discovery. I'm very pleased to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're so welcome. Hold on a minute. I've got a chat message here and I want to see what it is. So last night you tweeted, Tuesday, tens of millions of people did amazing and generous things in every country on earth with over 2.4 billion generated in the US alone. For those who don't know, tell us about the creation and ongoing evolution of Giving Tuesday what enabled it to literally transform giving around the world? Well, let, let me start by thanking you. I, I, I know many of the people who will have be joining us today will have participated yesterday in Giving Tuesday. And it's, uh, I, I have to, I had an experience yesterday, which is I think in a year when um, day after day after day, our experiences of social media have been negative, right? It's been bad news. It's been, yep. division, it's been awful things. It's been um, worrying things. Yesterday was the first day I've had this year where actually my social media, and it's largely to do with the algorithm they feed me, but my social media was actually pretty joyful, right? It was actually a whole bunch of stuff from around the world of people doing interesting things, of helping each other, of being generous to each other um, and supporting each other. And, and one of the reasons Giving Tuesday, I think, has had um, such resonance in previous years is it tells a different story than, than the one we often tell about people. And actually, especially the one we've told in some ways this year, which is, you know, it's a world where people are, are being driven apart from each other. It's a world in which people don't trust each other. It's a world where people can't be kind to each other. All of those themes, Giving Tuesday was designed to counteract, right? It was always, when we first thought of this product, it was always this idea, which was like this Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And you remember those images of kind of people lined up in front of stores <laughs> fighting over televisions, right? You remember those kinds of images? We always thought, well, what's the kind of philanthropic counterpoint to that, which is, which is what you know, where, where Giving Tuesday kind of began its life. And it's just been amazing to watch it to grow around the world. And, it, and it's, it's truly a project which has only grown because of the generosity of people who take it and make it bigger, right? They grab it and they take, they take it somewhere you would never expect. I was learning yesterday about a campaign in Sierra Leone this year. They, they did a special campaign around masking as a sign of generosity. That actually the act of masking is something which is, a, is an act of giving to your society and you know, to your community. And, you know, I, it was a reminder much needed for me, a reminder, I think, of the essential goodness in all of us. I agree with you. And you, you, you really created that when you were at the 92nd Street Y, right? Yeah, we were. So we were thinking a lot. Interesting, you know, something which, you know, a big topic for today really is like, how do you, how do you reimagine these great institutions, right? If you think about, the, you know, the, the 92nd Street Y, 144 years old as an institution, how do you reimagine what it does and how it does it? And what we were trying to think about then was um, the, the, one of the great challenges of any institution is you, your mission becomes your model. And what I mean by that is at some point you try and solve a problem. And the way you solve the problem is a certain kind of model which exists at the time. And then a lot of time passes and you can't get off that idea. And so at the 92nd Street Y, you know, in, in decades gone past, if you wanted to engage around philanthropy, you would have organized a lecture about philanthropy. You'd have had a philanthropy class. You would have gathered people and got them to the building to engage in a topic of philanthropy, but there wasn't really a way of distributing the message of, of the 92nd Street Y. And so Giving Tuesday was an experiment to say, okay, how do you take one of the values of the Y? And you know, the Y is a Jewish organization serving people of all backgrounds, but was very focused on the idea of 
um, how you think about being charitable and philanthropy, how would you scale that beyond the four walls of the why? And, and so Giving Tuesday was, was born in that spirit. And, and I remember the, the great conversation at the beginning, one of the big decisions we made about Giving Tuesday was not to brand it, right? Not to, not to call it the 92nd Street Why is Giving Tuesday, right? And anyone on this call who's in the nonprofit sector can probably imagine the conversation, which was like, we're gonna do this thing called Giving Tuesday, but we're not gonna take credit for it. We're not gonna make it the 92nd Street Why is Giving Tuesday. I remember I was talking to one of our board members at the time who said, this is great, I love this. Just explain to me where the, the Why's logo is gonna be. Will it be between Giving and Tuesday? And I was like, no, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put our logo on it because <clears throat> if we make it about us, it, it won't ever be owned by anybody else. No one else will be able to take it somewhere new. And I think that decision was, was pretty bold back then and actually has really proven Proven, um, proven the right one. Asha Curran, who's the CEO of Giving Tuesday, she talks about the importance of unbranding, this yeah. idea that we as institutions actually have to be less focused on putting our stamp on things and more focused on actually how you can be a part of something but not eat up all the space. And I think that's a very resonant idea today. I think so as well. So, you know, less than a year into your position as the new president and CEO of Lincoln Center, COVID-19 basically shuttered in-person in interactions. It really drastically changed you know, the landscape for artists and for arts organizations. Over across our country, we've seen at least a $14.6 billion negative impact to date. That's just with not-for-profit organizations. If you look at the entire creative economy, it's $150 billion and almost 3 million jobs mm -hmm. that currently don't exist. We don't know what that means. And we're getting a couple of questions off in a minute uh, about that. But as you look back at the almost 10 months, what stood out to you? Um, where did you find grace? Um, and how did you galvanize your team to really change your programming? Because you pivoted a lot to digital during that period. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, I think one thing we've seen, you think back now, um, I remember the, um, there was a video of the first lockdown in Italy, in Siena. Yeah, was, where they were. Um, remember this video, right? This is Yeah, singing from the balconies and. And this chorus, right? There was a chorus of oh. people um, singing together as a way of showing solidarity. And it was such a kind of meaningful metaphor for the, for the coronavirus. And then I think the thing we saw in New York, and I know I saw it, I know you, you see it across the country too, was um, was this moment at seven o'clock each night when everyone would come out to their windows and they would they would clap. And and, and I, we, um, I, remember, I remember we in New York, we would see so many amazing moments where you would recognize that actually there was this moment at seven o'clock at a time when everyone was so fearful, we were all being kept apart. There was a moment, and I always saw this in artistic terms, there was a moment this kind of like, Kind of ragtag community orchestra came to life, right? Everyone got out of their windows, banged pots of pans, and there was a clarinetist down the, down the road from me. And like, you have this sense that um, it showed us what the arts do so well, which is they help us connect with other human beings in a meaningful way. And that's been so important this year. And I think there's a kind of metaphor for, for the work of the arts, not just Lincoln Center, but the artistic community everywhere. What everyone did was they, they didn't stop music they didn't stop creating they didn't stop connecting they just found new ways often in unsatisfying ways actually but found new ways to meet their mission so I think the thing that I've been inspired by this year is you just look across the country at the organizations and the individuals who have found new ways to meet their mission even though their models have changed you know the acts of service or everyone in you know, the New York Philharmonic has been driving around in a pickup truck to take arts to people you've seen countless performers performing for free you've seen people doing concerts for medical workers. You know, the artistic community as a whole, uh, I think has just excelled at a time that it's been so badly damaged. It has excelled at actually creating service for, for the country. And I think one of the reasons there's such a great need for greater support for the arts in general, and of course, from the new administration is because the arts have served so fully this year at a time of such challenge, and we're gonna need a huge amount of help to, to get back on our feet. Didn't you also turn Lincoln Center into a, a place for people to come and get food? I know you did voting. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's not just a place for arts. Talk talk a little bit more about how you are 
really involving the community and because you're serving the community. I, look, I think we, we, we think of ourselves um, as a cultural center and to some degree as community center, right? And that it hasn't always been true, right? That isn't always the case. And so I think thinking about, we've got a lot, a lot of work to do to reimagine our relationship with our local community, which has from the very beginning um, was, was, was controversial and in some cases tragic, right? It's a very difficult and uncomfortable beginning of Lincoln Center's story. And over the years, we've got too distant from people closest to us. And so there's a lot of work that we have to do to start to rebuild that. And so we've been very focused on work around the census. For example, we became a polling place for the first time. Um, we've, been, uh, we've become a food distribution bank for the first time uh, on campus, providing the food insecure in our own community with, with some support. We also always had music. Uh, that, that was the, you know, we, for, for all of, um, I think it's fair to say of a kind of a more civic focus to our work, we never forget the fact that we're a cultural center. So it was wonderful to watch the musicians of the Philharmonic playing for those clients who were lining up for the food bank. So you have that kind of combination of the two. And I don't think for what it's worth, this was not for me um, a reaction to the coronavirus. I think we were very much pre-coronavirus. We were very much recognizing, I think that we as an institution have a lot of work to do as many cultural organizations do to reconnect with people who have felt too far from us. And, for, and, and, and in some cases we've kept too far. So I, I think that work had begun, I think it's intensified this year, no, no, no question. And you must've seen that across the field, Victoria. I mean, you, like, as you look across, the, as you look across the, the country alongside the, the great damage which has been caused, I think there is kind of a story you can see about um, resilience and optimism. I, I totally agree with you. In in some really unexpected ways. I've been excited to see some of these new hybrid formats that are coming out. Um, one here in Miami that the Miami City Ballet did where they commissioned a choreographer. He worked with the dancers over Zoom. Then they went in and filmed following guidelines and created duets that weren't there wow. from it. But I found it really moving as I did one of the concerts that I watched on, you know, Lincoln Center's feed where they were, they were playing to two frontline hospital workers and the man is sitting there and, and the woman with tears in their eyes and you're, you're this, you know, they're socially distanced or safely distanced from the violinist, but that connection that experience that was offered to them. I mean, having a musician playing for you like that or some of the others that I've seen both at Lincoln Center and other places where artists are just making themselves totally available as they do and conveying their sorrow, sorrow their laughter, their feelings mm -hmm. through their own artistic genre. And I think that's what artists do best. They give us a different lens on the world through their artistry. And for that, I am eternally grateful and makes me both on an individual le uh, level and certainly as a grant maker to want to support this creation, you know, the artistic creation um, and what that means for us. So we've got a question here from Peter that relates to this. Do you believe that the previous business models for the arts are still valid? Yes. Or is COVID forcing arts administrators to rethink how to deliver against mission? I think a bit of both. So I think that I mean the previous business models, you know, I, I, I think there's gonna be a world in which we're selling tickets and lots of them, right? I think especially once we get to a point where the, the pent up demand for congregation will be so significant. I mean, on a personal level, I will happily spend two years going out and never sit on Zoom again. I mean, it really, you know, there will be a point at which, given the opportunity, I think the demand for people to be with other people is going to be pretty significant. Oh, Henry, we have we have no, we don't know what you're saying with that. <laughs> so the so I do think that's going to be. So I think there'll be a real. I think there'll be a there'll be a big demand when the time comes. I do think what will happen. I think one of the, you know, that there are two there are two bits of the story for the performing arts, right? One is the kind of tragedy and the trauma, as you, as you point out at the start, especially to many individual artists. 
And then another part of this is there has been a transformation there. There has been more experiment in the digital space by necessity, right? Not by intention. I remember in, um, we used to do this thing at Lincoln Center every summer, which is we would bring in arts educators from around the country for a summer forum. It's a great thing, right? So we had hundreds of people would come to Lincoln Center. They would fly in and they'd have, you know, uh, three or four weeks together and it would be a life-changing experience for the people who came. I remember before coronavirus, we were having a conversation internally and saying, and it was an intellectual question at the time, would we be better off doing that every year or trying to build a digital network of 10,000 arts educators, right? Who never met in person, but you would create that digital network to share best practice and, and ideas and solidarity and all the rest of it. And we had an interesting conversation amongst the team, which is, which would you prefer? And some people want the in-person 300 and some people like the 10,000. Um, but that became not an academic exercise for us because we couldn't convene anymore. So we had to think about, okay, how do you scale this in some interesting ways? And so I think what, what I, my great hope is, is that what will end up happening is people will hang on to the best parts of the old model and then build alongside it what we've learned from this new world and how we start to connect around that. And, 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 and my optimistic, my optimistic, optimistic prediction is that we'll end up with people getting the best of both worlds, that we'll be able to actually add to our existing model with more digital. And I think it's also better saying, look, you know, the Knight Foundation has done some really interesting and useful work in, in, in preparedness for this. Our sector's got a lot, long way to go to kind of catch up with digital. You know, we have unnecessarily resisted it in many ways with the argument that somehow it's lightweight and trivial and, um, and unimportant. And that can often be true of the digital world, but it isn't always true, right? There is, there is absolutely meaning and substance to be found in digital lives. And so I think our job going forward is, is as, as artistic organizations is, is how do we identify the same quality that we put on our stages online and how do we meld those worlds together in a meaningful way? And uh, that's certainly going to be, be, be a big, big priority for Lincoln Center. Yeah, and I've, you know, I've said this before in some of these conversations because I'm, I'm an, enjoying arts, experiencing art is, is sort of visceral for me. And because I'm not a digital native, I'm a learner, but I'm not a digital native. It's can we create experiences that evoke that same kind of response? in people because for me live performance is just something to behold but i wanted wanted to say here that we actually have somebody joining us from india paramita uh today i think that's the somebody the, the furthest away that i've had yet in one of these but we've got a couple of questions you know one that i wanted to get back to because it's going to relate to a question that i um ask you later in, in our conversations but it's you know, how do you think institutions like Lincoln Center can better engage with Native American communities and artists? For example, with uh, Lenape on whose land Lincoln Center was, was built upon. And I know that we, you and I have talked some about this as well. So if you don't mind taking that one on. Yeah, look, I think all of our, I think we all need to go through a period of kind of, re, of reinstitution, right? Which is by which I mean, how do we think about reconnecting with the, the, the land that we live on, the, the world that we inhabit, the communities that we represent and those that we don't, right? That's a, a voyage of discovery. And so we've we put together a project called the Mirror Project, which is all about how we do two things. One, how do we as an institution better reflect the world that we live in and the city we live in? And two, also, how do we look in the mirror? How do we as an institution look back and look back on the parts of our history that we aren't proud of and reckon with them in a meaningful way? So that, that's exactly the kind of way I think that we are gonna to start to reset a relationship with a, a number of groups of people who have felt too distant from Lincoln Center and too disconnected from Lincoln Center. And our job, I think as administrators is to, is to, is to do whatever we can to bring down some barriers and to do whatever we can to make some connections. And that's been a priority for, for us from the, from the start. And, and, and anyone who has come through this year, I think feels that that responsibility to an even more significant degree. Another one uh, related to this is, you know, have you explored how you develop partnerships with smaller and mid-sized organizations? And will post-COVID-19 world in the arts be smaller with mergers between like organizations in order to survive? That last question I get a lot. Yeah, I think the answer is, um... We've certainly thinking a lot about um, partnership, although I don't think historically we've been as good at this as we need to get, right? I think one of the dangers of um, 
becoming a big institution is you kind of um, start to believe your own press a little bit and you get um, you lose the capacity to be a good partner to lots of people. Um, and we've got to reclaim that. So we've done some projects I like a lot. There was a project we did with the Cultural Innovation Fund, which was a project which connected us to small arts organizations throughout the, the five boroughs, which was a really powerful way actually of us thinking about how you innovate at scale and, and a way for us to learn from, from all sorts of arts organizations who really weren't on kind of the Lincoln Center radar. But I think the work, our work going forward is actually to, is, is for, by necessity, we're all going to be hyper-local hyper organizations for a while, right? It's going to be a long time since we have lots of people flooding in from around the world. So I do think it's a good opportunity for us to kind of reconnect to how we engage with the city. And, and we've certainly been trying to do that at Lincoln Center. The, um, the, 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 the work we've begun, and I, I want to underscore begun because it's many years of work ahead. The work we have begun, I think, is to kind of reset our relationship, particularly with community groups. And to re-engage with with people and, and and parts of the city who have who have not been part of Lincoln Center's world in the way that, that they need to be. And here's a, another question that relates to this conversation. Um, you know, are institutions like Lincoln Center turning to internet artists to create unconventional intersections when rethinking the public stage to the personalized computer? And that comes from Jillian. Yes, I think this is a really interesting, I'm actually, I think there's, there's two, there's something very interesting, we've seen two things happen in the last year particularly, right, one has been a kind of repurposing of work, so one has been, let's find a way of putting that thing we've always done in halls onto the internet, so that's the digital live stream as a concert or those kinds of things, which essentially is let's just try and replicate the in-person experience and put it on the internet, and then the other thing we've seen is things which are designed for the internet as a stage, now that's been happening for a long time, but you've obviously seen it intensify this year. So there's been a really interesting, I think, trend in what you, you know, that kind of digital arts, which is work, which is designed not for a theater and then repositioned, but actually designed for the internet. And I think that's been some of the stuff that I've been very struck by this year. We did a bunch of stuff with the, um, the, the works and process program at the Guggenheim, we did a collaboration with them. And it led to some really interesting work, which was done, which was actually done outside at Lincoln Center on the plaza which was designed essentially for an internet stage. It wasn't designed for an in-person audience. And I think that is a very promising direction. And we're certainly gonna do some more work to, to learn and to understand some of the work in that field and, and see what part Lincoln Center might play. And another one, and then I'll go on to my next question um, for you, Henry, is this one is from um, Hadassah. Are you focused on keeping new audiences that have developed via Zoom? and have your contributions from remote audiences been significant? Um, yes and no, in, in that order. So I think- uh, <laughs> I've wondered about that. Um, uh, so I think we've, I think that there's definitely been a world of people we've opened up to. Like if you listen to the Met Opera right now, they've had 15 million people watch their free live stream in the evenings. It's yeah. an amazing service throughout this year to people, which is providing free opera to people around the world. Um, and, you know, that's that's had a financial positive, but by no means a very significant one, right? So I think part of the challenge is we, we've, and look, other industries went through this too. There was a point in all industries in which there was, you know, very little money to be ha had on the digital world. And, and then that sh shifted pretty quick. So I do think there's going to be a kind of a shift that will work out some smarter ways of engaging digitally. And I think that's going to be a big area of focus for, we've just set up a like, a, like an R&D lab at Lincoln Center specifically for that kind of question, which is, okay, how do we think about what the kind of revenue opportunities might be down the line in, in some more of those worlds? And then I think digital diversity in general was on our mind before coronavirus, which is one of the good, if spooky things about the platforms we have access to now is you can target audiences in a way you couldn't before. So if you're you know, interested in um, reaching a demographic between 20 and 35 of people in Brooklyn who love jazz, you can target those people pretty accurately. So what that means is you then actually can think more intentionally about curating audiences. So who is it you're actually trying to reach and who are you trying to bring to Lincoln Center and how are you trying to make those kinds of connections? So I think there's going to be some really interesting work in the kind of digital diversity space in the sense of actually us thinking about our marketing as a function of our DEI strategy. I think I think that's directionally going to be really interesting. And, and our, our team's done some really, really interesting work in that space. 
Well, I, th I think that um, uh, you, you sort of um, alluded to the program, but sort of the people that you, you're bringing in um, to do these collaborations are really interesting. You know, these, these connections between artists and looking at issues, you know, with them being able to decide, you know, what really, what is the project that they want to create? I think it's both freeing and a phenomenal opportunity to, um, to sort of address some of the issues that we've been seeing. But, you know, you and Jeremy Hyman's wrote a book, New Power, that really looks at old and new, new ways of looking at power. And in that, you two posited that for every business, every organization, and every political activity, mobilization of networks is the key if you want to get ahead. And you added to that, you need to do that, you need to be committed in a strategic way, prepared to think about how you can engage more people more meaningfully, meaningfully in your work. You know, so how is that playing out at Lincoln Center? And then maybe give people, we did, uh, there's a link that is posted in the chat, uh, folks, for, for those of you, I can tell you it's a great read and has given me a lot to think about. Uh, is I look at you know how we evaluate what's happening in our country and where we can target dollars and have even greater impact. So how's how's this playing out at Lincoln Center? So I think part of the um, if you think about kind of the old power world and the new power world, the the old power world um, which Lincoln Center was certainly um, has grown up in was one where you know a small number of individuals and organizations had a lot of power that they could kind of store up and spend down on their terms. And, if you will. and 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 uh, there'll be those who see hints of that in the grant making world as well right so you can see yeah. that there's there's that sense of a set of institutions that are very important to our world right but benefited from an old power world and what's beginning to shift now is this kind of wave of participation that is defining all of our world right this kind of people's capacity to be engaged is such an interesting and important thing so i think the interesting challenge for organizations is going to be how organizations who thrived in the old power world start to meet the new power world in interesting ways. And so I'll give you one example from Lincoln Center. We did a thing called Memorial for Us All. So it was a more, typically, if you want to have a memorial concert at Lincoln Center, someone very significant or someone of means would, would pass away and they would have a concert at Lincoln Center. Memorial for Us All was something we did with local um, faith groups who, uh, at the, you know, during the, the height of the coronavirus were all challenged by the same problem, which is that they couldn't have services, they couldn't have burials, they couldn't have funeral services. So Memorial for Us All was a weekly concert where we would have, in an old power way, the best musicians in the world perform. So we had, you know, Yo-Yo Ma and Norm Lewis and people. But New Yorkers all around the city could submit names of people they wanted to have recognized so that the concert would be a tribute to people they had lost. And so thousands of New Yorkers would submit names each week and we would scroll them across the screen as these works were being played. And that's just a small example of, I think, the kind of direction which is right for Lincoln Center, which is we're not suddenly going to crowdsource Lincoln Center, right? What we're going to try and do is look for meaningful ways to blend old and new power and bring more, participa more, participa more participation into our model. And if you want a, a striking example as to the opportunity, um, think about TikTok which I'm sure many of you are thinking about all the time. And just think about the huge um, enthusiasm for choreography and dance that is playing out now across TikTok. Think about the generations of people who are thinking of themselves as dancers and performers in ways they never would have done before. And there are two perspectives that old power organizations might take on this. One is, you know, this is trivial and it's not good enough and it's not disciplined enough. And, you know, and this is amateur, right? Posture one. Posture two is, there's this glorious opportunity of participation. So the question for institutions is how can we add value to, to those worlds? The, 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 the question isn't how can we make sure those worlds do what we want them to do? The question is what is the, the contribution we can provide, we can add to that world? So we've done a bunch of stuff this year, which has been kind of some fun dance videos, which have been kind of providing some expert dancers to teach dance steps and scale those. But I think the, the, the kind of the, the, the one extraordinary thing for all of us in the arts right now is there has never been more art just from a volume perspective right and that sounds like a weird thing to say but actually the creation of art we've never had more artworks we've never had more audiences we've never had more people of different backgrounds presenting their arts to a market in a way that that was actually pretty narrowly prescribed in the old power world 
So there's going to be a very interesting shift in how institutions are, are, are ours, you know, chief amongst them, how we reimagine our work to not ignore that world or minimize it, but to uh, connect with it. I think that's a really good question. Yeah, and so here, one, one last question. I told you our 30 minutes would go by in a blink Mind. and it has. So this is from um, Carlos here with the Miami Lighthouse for the Blind. And he says, how is your projection to have normal activities after the majority of people get the vaccine? You know, will the live arts performances normalize? I, I don't think I have an expert view on that of any kind. Yeah. We, we have a medical council we put together on Lincoln Center of who in leading experts in the medical world and kind of the line we're getting for, 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 from them was, you know, you next summer looking, looking, you know, viable, not definite, but there's definitely a good chance. I think vaccination is going to be the, the, the key question. And I think just as a, as a closing thought, I think one thing which is going to be a big challenge in general next year is, is vaccination campaigns. And I yeah. think the arts community is going to have a real role to play, particularly um, in communities who historically have distrusted the medical professions. The arts world have a really interesting role to play in connecting with groups across the country in the same way actually the arts community did with the census it really did a good job I think in that so I think as we think about the kind of the the, the great the great irony is not going to the great irony of the coronavirus is going to be that we end up that we get the miracle which is a vaccine exists and yet people won't take it so I think that's going to be a really interesting and challenging and important civic question for 2021 and and, and with with some others we're doing some thinking around how the arts might play a role there so I lied one more question here, but any prospect of a digital performance and art constituent being added in the foreseeable future, just as jazz at Lincoln Center was added in 96 and MetLive in HD was launched in 2006? Yeah, I, I, on the radar. I don't think, I think that it's definitely the case that we ought to be, we at Lincoln Center, you know, we're Lincoln Center for the performing arts, which is all of them. And there's lots of areas we've actually historically either ignored or not paid much attention to. So I think one of the things for the, for the years ahead is how do we better engage with some disciplines we've overlooked? And, and I would think of digital arts as one of the more exciting ones of those. I couldn't agree with you more in that you know that that is an interest of night. So let's see what uh, collaborations come up. I'm looking, so I'm looking forward to it. Our time is up today. I'd like to thank all of you for joining and for submitting your questions. It always makes the conversations even better when we know exactly what's on your mind. Special thanks to Henry. It's, uh, it's just been fun and that, that makes for a great day. And I wanna thank the night production crew, Justin, Raul and Natalia for making this all happen. Remind you that the beats at the top of the show were designed and created by Chris Barr, our director of art and technology here at night. And the music that will play us out is composed and performed by the amazing jazz pianist in Akron's own, one of Night City's, Theron Brown. And to ask you to tune in on December 10th for an episode of Informed and Engaged, hosted by our journalism colleagues. What to expect after the unexpected 2021 predictions for journalism and informed communities. Thanks so much for being with us. Again, Henry, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, bye.